So I already know that this video is probably going to be one of the most decisive videos that I have put out on this channel so far. Anytime you start talking about law books and records, there are people that have opinions about how it should be done, how it shouldn't be done. And so I wanted to, on the front side of this video, let you guys know what my thoughts were. This video is not me explaining how you should do a law book or not me explaining how um, you are supposed to do a law book. It is me starting out explaining to owners what their responsibility is when it comes to maintaining records on their aircraft. And then it goes into, as a mechanic and an IA, what I did on this particular annual inspection for the Cessna 140. Now, I'm being very transparent here, showing records that I have written for this aircraft. And I'm sure that people are going to disagree with some of the things I've either put in there or how it's written. I have no problem with you commenting and let me know the issues with why I've done it the way I've done it. I have done it for a very specific reason and I will say that our local FISDO, the way that I do these records, has evaluated logbooks written just like this dozens of times and are very positive towards the way that we used to do this in a flight school and the way that I'm doing this on my Cessna 140. In this video, I'm going to discuss really a way that a flight school record can be written up for simplification. So that way when you have new students that are very unfamiliar with maintenance records, they can go into a check ride and easily be able to explain those records to the examiner. It doesn't have to be this way for an owner. Personally, I really just like this method. And even though I may or may not have an annual inspection or a 100 hour inspection between annuals, I'm hoping to fly enough, that I'll have at least 100 or 200 hours on the aircraft between annuals and I can use this method that I'm about to show you guys for my personal aircraft as well. So I really do appreciate you watching. I know that there are people out there that are going to have different perspectives from what I am doing here in this video. Personally, I am okay with differing opinions and I really do want to see what your opinion is about the way a particular logbook should be. So I look forward to learning from you guys on what you do in your maintenance records for the very seasoned IAs that I know that watch this, as well as some of you that are brand new at this, looking from the outside in, getting an opportunity to learn about this. A good pilot's always learning, and that applies to mechanics as well. So let's start talking about maintenance records. So today I'm wrapping up the annual inspection, signing off the Cessna 140, and we are finally ready to fly this aircraft. But I thought it would be a great opportunity to talk from an owner's perspective about our responsibility when it comes to maintenance records. And so specifically, I'm going to be walking through part 91, subpart E, which deals with maintenance, preventative maintenance, and alterations to an aircraft. But I'm also going to be looking at advisory circulars. I wanted to go ahead and tell you guys about this on the front side so you can maybe have them available. Advisory circular uh, 43-9C talks about maintenance records. And so I will reference it multiple times as we go through this discussion. So part 91401 just tells you that this is really talking about general aviation aircraft and not airliners or anything that's on a continuous airworthiness maintenance program or camp. The 91403 then talks about the fact that it is the owner or operator of an aircraft's primary responsibility for maintaining the aircraft in an airworthiness condition, including compliance with Part 39 of this chapter, which refers to airworthiness directives. So it might surprise you, and I know it did me, even though I had a little bit of maintenance training when I was first an owner, that the owner is responsible for making sure that the records are maintained. Regulation 91417 is incredibly important for owners to understand. And the main thing is, is there's two separate types of things that should go in the law book. And then there's a list of records that are supposed to be kept. The first one is records of maintenance, preventative maintenance, and alterations. That comes in 91417A1. But then you're also going to keep the records of the 100 hour annual and if it applies progressive or any other approved inspections if required by the FAA. The records have to include three things. A description of the work performed, which could be a reference to acceptable data by the administrator. Now here's where we're going to jump to Advisory Circular 43-9 and look at what the maintenance advisory circular says that reference to data can be. If the description of work performed is too voluminous, is what the advisory circular says, or if it's too large, 
then the mechanic is allowed to reference a manufacturer's manual, service letter, bulletin, work orders, an advisory, circular, and other things that can accurately describe how it was done or what was done, and that may be referenced instead of writing all of that out. You'll also need the date that the work was performed as well as the signature and certificate number of the person approving the aircraft and returning it to service. And that's a 91 requirement. Part 43 is slightly different and we're not going to get into those differences because this is for an owner. The second section says you need to keep the records that contain the total time of the airframe, engine, and propeller. Advisory Circular 43-9 states, Some circumstances impact the owner or operator's ability to comply with this regulation. For example, in the case of rebuilt engines, the owner or operator would not have any way of noting total time in service. Since 91-421 permits the maintenance record to be discontinued and the engine to be restarted at zero time, in this case, the maintenance record and the time in service subsequent to a rebuild compromise a satisfactory record. Total time in service of the airframe is going to come up again when we talk about lost maintenance records. Number two is the current status of life-limited parts. We don't have a lot of life-limited parts in general aviation. Fortunately, it's life-limited parts are things that would have to be replaced regardless of condition at a certain time or interval. Like the rotor of a helicopter is a time-limited or life-limited part. Number three is the time since last overhaul of all items installed on the aircraft which require to be overhauled at a time-specific basis. Fortunately, for general aviation in Part 91, this doesn't really apply. We are overhaul on condition, not on a time basis. Number four, you need the current inspection status of the aircraft, including the time since the last inspection required by the inspection program. For most general aviation aircraft, this is going to be an annual inspection, which is required by Part 91 to be completed every 12 calendar months. It could also be a 100-hour inspection if the aircraft is for hire. Number five is the current status of all airworthiness directives. If you guys remember back when I was doing my video on airworthiness directive research, the reason I was doing that was because I need that record for the Cessna 140 and unfortunately some of those were destroyed. So I have to retain and maintain the current status of those amendments to part 39 airworthiness directives. The last one is copies of the 337 forms for major alteration and repairs, and that's what this means here. Forms prescribed by 43.9D of this chapter for each major alteration of the airframe and currently installed engines, rotors, propellers, and appliances. So it's just the major alteration and repair forms. So for general aviation, there are really only four of these that apply to us. The first one, total time of the airframe. The fourth one, the current status of the inspections of the aircraft. And then the fifth and sixth ones the airworthiness directives, and any major alterations and repairs. So how long do we have to keep these records? A lot of people think it's permanently, and it's part of this permanent record. But that's not the case. 91417B states that the owner or operator shall retain the following records for the periods prescribed. The records specified in paragraph A1 or the inspections and maintenance that we've discussed in section A1 should be retained until the work is repeated or superseded by the other work or one year after the work is performed. Anything in paragraph A2, the total time, uh, airworthiness directives, those things we just talked about, are supposed to be retained and transferred with the aircraft itself to the new owner. So technically, your logs, what you need from an FAA legal perspective, is the last year of maintenance and inspections. As soon as you do a new annual inspection, you have superseded the previous annual inspection. And legally, for the FAA, you only need the most recent one for the airworthiness of the aircraft. We'll talk about why you shouldn't throw away your records, though. So let's say you're like me, and you find an aircraft, but it's got an incomplete record. Some of the logbooks have been destroyed or completely lost. So what do you need to do? Well, legally you need to figure out those four items that we just discussed as well as if there are any life limited parts or um, required overhaul parts that we discussed that aren't typical for general aviation aircraft. If you've got something like that, it's a whole new ball game and you definitely need to consult an IA with some good experience. But for a normal general aviation aircraft, a vintage aircraft like my Cessna 140, when you run into that situation, there's a couple steps you can do to try to recover as much of the information as possible. The first of which is going to the FAA's website and requesting the records for your aircraft or that aircraft. Hopefully this is going to have a complete listing of all of those major alterations and repairs, the 337 forms, the sixth item, 
and that'll at least let you have the copy of those records. For Air Wilderness Directives, you're going to have to find an IA or assist an IA in doing the research on what Air Wilderness Directives apply and see if you can determine if these have been accomplished by someone else or if it's a recurring AD that it can be accomplished. The current inspection status of the aircraft is pretty easy. You need to have an annual inspection and probably it's going to have a few records for the last few years if it still has some, hopefully. There are instances where there are no records in which you need to complete the annual to suffice this. The total time in service of the airframe, each engine, propeller, and each rotor is always the hardest one to determine. Inside of Advisory Circular 43-9, uh, there is a section that discusses um, what do you do with lost logs or what, what happens if you have a lost maintenance record. So item number 12 under 43-9 here states that occasionally the records for an aircraft are lost or destroyed. In order to reconstruct them, it is necessary to establish the total time in service of the airframe. This can be done by reference to other records that reflect the total time in service. Research of maintenance records maintained by repair facilities and reference to records maintained by individual mechanics, etc. When these things have been done and the record is still incomplete, the owner operator may make a notarized statement in the new record describing the loss and establishing the time in service based on the research and the best estimate of time in service. And let me just show you an example of what that would look like. I've typed up an example of what the record should look like for this aircraft. Something along the lines of this would make a good explanation of a lost record. So why even worry about maintenance records? Why even just not keep the minimum like the FAA says. I mean, legally, all that Part 91 says is you have to have the most recent inspection and these other items for the previous year. The reason we keep that is for the value of the aircraft. As soon as a potential buyer looks at your aircraft and sees that all you have is the last year's worth of records on it, even if you do have the minimum, that total time for the airframe, the AD list, the um, compliance record for those airworthiness directives. They're going to be very skeptical about the maintenance done on it because you've gotten rid of it. So that's the reason that we want a good, clean, thorough, effective log. And let me show you an example of what I mean by a good, clean, thorough, effective log book by the entry that I'm going to be doing on the Cessna 140. So let's head out to the hangar and we'll talk about that. All right, so I'm back out here in the hangar now on a balmy Saturday morning. And I uh, just kind of wanted to walk through a few things on the Cessna 140 specifically. So if you're following this project, this is where I'm going to talk specifically about the records for the 140. Um, if you're just looking at aircraft maintenance record, this is a plane that I've been working on for about the last year now. And we are a few days away from flying it out of my personal grass strip here. And uh, really excited about bringing this bird back to life after almost a decade of not flying. So most of your aircraft records, um, most people will break up uh, your airframe and, and your engine log books into two separate logs. They'll even sometimes have a propeller log specific to the prop that's on the aircraft, which is fine. The FAA says you can do that in the regulations and the benefit of doing that is, let's say that I wanted to either overhaul or pull this engine and put a new one on. Well then instead of all of the records of that engine being tied to the airframe, um, I have a book that if I wanted to sell this engine uh, to an individual and let them take it, I could also give them the records, the entire records from the time this engine was hung until I removed it and installed a new one, and I could give that to them. And they could have those records and they could either do a top overhaul if they wanted to or just maintain the engine and keep it flying as is. Um, until they decided to overhaul or send it out to get rebuilt. So that's uh, one of the things that this aircraft has done on it, which is good. It does not have a propeller log book, which is fine because this is a fixed pitch prop. So the propeller entry, I just tied to the engine entry, as you'll see um, here in a little bit. Because probably if I were to pull this engine, I would simultaneously send the propeller out for overhaul or inspection. Um, so that's where we are currently. Now, one of the things that's uh, been a problem with this aircraft is previously its records were destroyed in a fire. And I think I've showed this before, but here's what I have of the first 
uh, almost 50 years of this aircraft. It is a um, just a remnant of a logbook that has been burned with fire. So fortunately for me, there is a record from the previous logbook, which I have, dating back to uh, July of 1990, when he hung this engine that's currently on the aircraft, that um, states the total time for the aircraft. I'm gonna make an entire separate video for dealing with total loss logs. This one's just gonna talk about signing off the annual inspection. There are really two types of uh, just mechanics, if you wanna think of it like that. When you go and get your AMP license, you are certified to work on aircraft um, by the FAA. You take written exams and a practical and oral exam to get a certificate to do maintenance on a aircraft. Well, once you've done maintenance for a couple of years, you can go take another written exam to become an inspector, and they call it an IA, Inspector's Authorization. This individual is allowed to sign off major alterations and repairs, 337 forms that we've kind of talked about in the previous part of this video, as well as annual inspections. You have to be an inspector to sign off an annual inspection. Now what's interesting is the inspection itself is not the maintenance that takes place on it. Now you will see plenty of logbook entries, and this is not a wrong way I guess to do this, that say I certify that this aircraft has been inspected in accordance with a 100 hour slash annual inspection. Well, those are two different things, not in the practice of what they are, but on paper, they're two different things. At my previous work, this is how we uh, distinguish the two. You would have someone, an AMP, with their AMP certificate, sign off the 100 hour inspection. And then even if it was the same individual, the IA comes in behind and signs off the annual inspection. Now I know this might seem confusing right off the bat, but let me explain why uh, I like that method as well as if you are a flight school or you're an individual owner, I kind of recommend this method of doing your inspections. Now you'll have to work with your AMP and they'll do what they feel comfortable with. When I worked at a flight school and we had new private pilot students taking records for a check ride and showing them those records and showing them the last 100 hour inspection if it was required and the last annual inspection as well as the most current status of the ADs. By separating the annual inspection and actually highlighting the words annual inspection, it made it very easy for potentially new pilots to locate and find those records. I actually kind of really like that and even though I fully understand what the records are saying, by separating that, even though it's a little bit different, it's not against any FAA regulations, I can see where each 100 hour inspection was done as well as each annual was done. Now, quick word on 100-hour inspections. Legally, 100-hour inspections are not required for private aircraft. They're only required when it's for higher operations. Personally, because I'm an AMP and an IA, I'll do the 100-hour inspection every 100 hour of tack time because I'm changing the oil typically anyways, and there's sometimes an airworthiness directive that's due at that time anyway. So why not go ahead and do that 100-hour inspection at that time and if it's close enough to the annual, just wrap it up into an annual as well. As I previously stated, the, the checklist for the 100-hour inspection and the annual are identical. It's just who's signing it off, as well as the time frame, um, 100 hours of TAC or flight time versus 12 calendar months with the annual inspection. So with all that being said, let's look at this annual inspection on the Cessna 140. So as you guys can see here, I've got a airframe entry um, for the 100 hour inspection. And it's got the total time, the tack time. Inside of the 100 hour, I've got the complied with 100 hour inspection in accordance with the FAR 43 Appendix D. That's what I'm complying, or that's what I'm using for my checklist. But I also use the Cessna 100 series maintenance manual for reference. So now that I've got the 100 hour out of the way on the airframe, let's look at the annual entry. And this is going to be printed off and immediately following the 100 hour, I will sign these back to back. It's basically the same inspection. I'm just saying that on one side, I did the 100 hour. On the other, I've done the annual. And an annual substitutes or replaces a 100 hour entry. I know that. But again, I'm breaking these up for ease of everyone that would look at this after me. There are people that look at this that do not understand maintenance records from an AMP perspective. So by breaking this up, even though it's not required and it's not even typical in FAA logbooks, 
it will be easier on those that come after me to locate those inspections. So let's look at this airframe inspection for the annual. I've got the annual inspection bold and it's very simple. I've complied with FAR 43 Appendix D, that same checklist that we previously talked about using the Cessna 100 series maintenance manuals reference. The ELT was inspected in accordance with 91207D and was found in satisfactory condition. I did install a new battery and that battery is next due September of 2024. The aircraft, including engine and propeller, has been inspected in accordance with an annual inspection and was determined to be in an airworthy condition. That comes directly from FAR 43 that gives the maintenance individuals, the inspector, the airworthiness statement that we're supposed to attach to the aircraft. I did modify it to include engine and propeller, and here's why. You can't do an annual inspection on a component. You do it on an aircraft. This phrase, is also included in the engine annual as you can see here and that's all that will be included in the annual inspection for the engine. The rest of it is all of the maintenance that was done is included in the engine 100 hour inspection. Again these are broken up just to make it easier for people coming after me to understand when certain things were done and what was done. I highly recommend keeping a airworthiness directive compliance record uh, and there's an example of all the things that should be on that in Advisory Circular 43-9. This is a great reference that allows you not to have to go search arbitrarily in the law book for when these airworthiness directives were complied with, but rather a guide to show you immediately where to go to find the date that they were signed off. To be honest, if your IA or your AMP signs these airworthiness directives off on that sheet, it's just as valid as a logbook entry. But sometimes this is just a good reference to say, okay, so this recurring AD was last done on this date, this uh, terminating action AD was last done on this date, and it allows you to very quickly locate the date and go find the entry in the logbook. So I'm gonna be building one of these for the Cessna 140, and I always do that. Previous aircraft, I made sure they had a good AD compliance record that was maybe an addendum or an addition to the maintenance record. So as of right now, we're good to go. Uh, I really do appreciate you guys watching this video. Again, I know that it can be a very controversial topic. Um, I just wanted to share kind of what I've done on this Cessna 140. This video has taken me longer to edit than any of the videos I've created so far because I wanted to make sure that I don't uh, either accidentally provide some inaccurate information or I don't thoroughly research the topic, hence the diving into the regulations, looking at advisory circular 43-9, and then all the time that I spent thinking about how I wanted to present this to you guys. So I hope you've enjoyed it. This week I'm planning on flying out. I've got everything done. Um, those records are done now. And we are looking at, hopefully, uh, in just a few days, uh, taking off for the very first time. Can't wait to share that experience with you guys and some of the adventures I have planned coming up. Thanks for watching again. We'll see you soon.